the outside of the horizon of our universe is a description of the possibility of all universes. And the inside surface of that distant horizon is the physical description of our interior of the universe, all stored as quantum information. And so it's just like the reverse of a Miko or a black hole. Black hole is physical outside, pure quantum inside. The distant horizon is pure physical inside and pure quantum outside. It turns out that our universe then is but a bubble in the sea of all possible universes. It's a physical of it's a it's a bubble of physical being in a sea of potential for such bubbles, and also for the potential of there being a divine spirit, which is now in contact with these surface bubbles, with all the universes. If there is a supreme being, you can go to the G word if you like, capital G O D, mm-hmm. if you like. But there apparently is such a thing, which is um, the existence of a super quantum field that is super to all of the little fields that describe individual universes. So we are but bubbles of physicality in the possibility of a supreme being. Welcome to another installment of Behind Greatness. It is Luciano here speaking as usual. So uh, as per usual, I want to invite you, the listener, to share, review, like, and come again. Uh, thanks for coming on to this journey uh, and coming on to this journey with us, because uh, really it, it is a, a partnership and listenership and, uh, uh, and seeking um, here in first person. We're having lots of fun. Uh, We continue to have lots of fun. uh, And that fun uh, manifests itself in a different form uh, with every conversation that we have. So uh, again, today we expect the same, even though today we have for the third time, this is the first time that we have a speaker, or excuse me, a guest on for a third time uh, and uh, no less excited than the first time uh, we had him on. We welcome back Dr. Rudy Shield. Uh, he was in episode 170, I, I think I have it memorized well, 179 and 185. Have a listen to those episodes uh, if you'd like before this one. Otherwise, uh, let's just go. Rudy, welcome back. Thank you, Luciano. Uh, lots has been going on. Uh, lots has been going on in your world, uh, in your sphere uh, of uh, uh, of excitement. Can I say that? Because uh, uh, you, uh, you, when you when you poke me with these emails and these messages, I, I get um, I get all motivated because <laughs> you're excited. I want to be excited, even though I I understand a, a, a less than a fraction of what uh, what you've studied in your life. But you know that's part of the reason why we had you on, other than uh, your great haircut that you have today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we just came off uh, this week. Uh, with the total eclipse uh, event on the eighth, so we're we're recording here like four days later. Uh, so I know that you want to talk about that too, uh, but there's something called the event horizon, and there's uh, something that was uh, that has been uh, just discovered uh, that we want to talk about. It's really fascinating how scientists have now developed the techniques and the, the hardware to be able to combine all of the world's radio telescopes operating at millimeter range frequencies to make effectively a synthesized radio telescope having the resolution and many properties of a telescope the size of the entire Earth. And so this comes about because the resolution limits are set by the largest diameter of correctly phased information that you have available to you. And in principle, and now in practice, we've learned to phase these materials together 
as though the Earth is one giant telescope with reporting stations sampling the entire picture and the computer able to fill in the details uh, underneath. And how long have we been doing this? We've been we've known how to do this for about 20 years. We've had the mathematics that shows uh, it would be possible. We took baby steps at first and made interferometers like the VLA uh, in Socorro, New Mexico, and then uh, intercontinental uh, ones. But that was over only three stations, perhaps. But now we're up to 10 or 12 stations, including one at the South Pole, for example. Hmm. So that fills in a lot of de uh, detail about the southern sky. One's in Australia, Europe, uh, and of course, all over the North American continent. A any in Asia? I'm not aware. I believe that there is one in Korea. You might want to include that in Asia. And I don't remember if there is one in Japan. Uh, it's possible. Uh, I hope there is. But anyway, that gives us the ability to achieve unprecedented re resolution to examine perfectly the um, black hole type object that's at the center of our galaxy. And we have always called this object Sagittarius A when it was discovered. And eventually when we found that it contained the image and the radiations from the black hole, we go to Sagittarius A star to describe the black hole character object that's at the center of our galaxy. It has a mass of about 4 million suns, and um, the uh, luminosity outshining all of the um, probably... 100 million stars in our galaxy. So this is a humongously bright object, and we will be talking before long about the source of that luminosity. It's not starlight. It's something else that was expected and predicted, and now we see it uh, in manifestation in the images made with the Earth as a giant radio telescope. Image that I've shown is an image which is made in the light that we call polarized light. And polarized means that the oscillations that were induced by the radio telescopes and received from an outside source reflect the nature of the driving electromagnetic currents which created the radio signal in the first place. And so what I mean is uh, that if the radio signal was made with a tall antenna the way they usually are mm -hmm. in your city, somewhere in the suburbs, a little off of downtown, uh, will be a tall tower perhaps 10 or 12 stories high, and there's a central wire in the tower, and the wire carries oscillations up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down, and those transmit a radio wave. But the up and downness of its origin, of the wave's origin, is reflected in the properties of the signal, and that can be recognized. And the object at the center of our galaxy also is doing this. It is revealing in the up and downness of its oscillations, it's revealing the nature of how the radio source at Sagittarius A star in the center of our galaxy, how it is generating its radio waves. In other words, the radio signal we observe reflects 
what are called polarizing properties of the source that originates the radio waves. So that's what we're celebrating. The fact that we've been able to do this, put it all together, and now map the way the brightness of the source is contributed to overall by various subcomponents within the source, which have different uh, polarization properties compared to each other. One has oscillations one way, one has oscillations another way, one may be a circular pattern, and all of that can be eked out of the restored signal, and it's a marvel of computing arranged by the radio astronomy community. Well done, chaps. And um, we now have this image to study, and um, it has profoundly influenced what we understand to be the character of the black hole, which we can now see for the first time directly. Because when you take the large size of the Earth and you uh, imagine that all of the Earth's surface is covered, but just not completely, it's only 5% covered, but we can make a giant radio telescope of the Earth in this way. And we have, and so the new observation produced by the Event Horizon team, um, actually uh, made at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics principally, my place of work at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts, on the Harvard campus. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we now can understand the details of how the quasar happens to be more luminous than all the 10 billion stars in the galaxy that we occupy. So how can an object be more luminous than a star? Well, you have uh, clusters of stars that can be 100 to 500 stars more luminous than an individual star. And um, uh, the luminosity emitted by the uh, black hole is affected by um, the other kinds of radiations that become emitted because the enormous gravity from such a small object at the center of our galaxy, that gravity drives matter toward the center. The elementary particles are electrons, protons, and neutrons. There is another one that will be important in this are positive electrons, and we call those positrons. And they enter the story because we will see that much of the radiation is caused by the generation of electron, positron uh, objects in which the two particles rotate around each other that sometimes is given the name positronium. That is, an electron and a positron spinning in an orbit um, like two objects of mass, feeling their gravity. In this case, they feel the charge of the electron against the positive electron, and there's an attraction there. And uh, because of these attractions, matter tries to fall, driven by gravity, to the center, but they're impeded because the uh, ionized state of the matter has made the positrons and electrons first separate a little bit, but then get attracted to each other. And eventually, that attraction causes them to spin around following along field lines, and we will be showing pictures of that in just a moment. This had already been seen in the outer parts of the object, which were observed by a telescope flown in the back end of a Boeing 747, custom modified by NASA 
to call the Stratospheric Observatory. Its uh, acronym is SOFIA. And it's a very interesting case of a 747, which they were able to cut a large hole, in fact, this wide, in the back of the fuselage, through this hole in the fuselage of the rear of the airplane, a telescope can see the sky and move around. Now, very interestingly, because the Earth's atmosphere always has a little bit of high density, low density structure in it, and this an airplane is flying through this minefield of these slightly dense or or rare um, atmospheric fluctuations. The stars jiggle around a little bit in a telescope, and so what we do is we compensate for that jiggling around using the control system of the aircraft so that the telescope is pointed fixed on the on the, the target and then we tell the computer now fly the aircraft hmm. so the way this is done is that the reason that we want of the black hole object has some stars around it, too. So with a little mirror, we pick off the light of one star. And then, with electronics, we require that that star always be in that fixed location by adjusting the, the, the pointing and direction of the aircraft. And that way, the object of interest, the black hole, will be perfectly steady. So here you have a real engineering um, um, miracle, that is a telescope being flying an airplane. The airplane is flown by the computer. It's amazing. Through the telescope. So that's the things that NASA does. How, how long has that been operational? Like, How old is that technology? Um, this observation was made about five years ago. The hmm. telescope has been under development and operation for about 15 years. Wow. It's called the SOFIA Forecast Experiment. So that's S-O-F-I-A, and then second word, F-O-R-C-A-S-T, where forecast refers to the instrument that's on the telescope to make the infrared image. Is there a reason why they pick uh, uh, the Greek word for wisdom? Did they indeed? Uh, I didn't know. Hmm. And I think it's just a concatenation of the letters F O R C A S T. And I don't remember what that's uh, what the, what that is when it's all spelled out. Sure. But um, it's a program within NASA. And um, if you mess around on the NASA pages, you will find a lot of pictures that were made with this very clever telescope. The aircraft is typically operated at 35,000 feet. However, it can fly higher. And so for this experiment, they pushed the, teles the telescope and the aircraft to its limits, which are more like 45,000 feet. And that's where they go to make these observations with the intent of being above most of the jiggly um, attributes of the atmosphere. The little the thin clouds and the air flows and gusts of winds colliding and all that kind of stuff. They want to be above it for the clearest and most stable stars, uh, uh, views of the stars. It's funny, I appreciate you saying uh, jiggly because I completely understood that kind of language. You didn't have to explain what Jiggly was. I understood. It was perfect. Perfect. First try. <laughs> but the only thing. <laughs> uh, you, you've said it twice now, and I, I, I want to understand better. When you say black hole object, because when I see, obviously as a layperson, when I, when I hear or see black hole, in my, it, it, when I envision black hole, I envision a black hole. I don't know what a black hole object is. Is it something in the middle of a black hole? Is it something that's part of a black hole? Is it something that's that accompanies it like a pilot fish? <laughs> what is that? What does that mean? The answer is D, none of the above. Ah, so, I have to um, offer that option. What's, what's <laughs> happening here is that 
we're not really sure we know today what we mean by a black hole, because the literature that's considered to be the research literature um, considers that a black hole is an object which has a horizon of infinite density beyond which we can't see and will only be able to surmise what would be inside of that. Now, um, the object that nature makes, in fact, is not exactly that object. And people have instead invented an acronym called AMICO, M-E-C-O, and that stands for Magnetic Eternally Collapsing Object. Now, that's very significantly different from a black hole, where it's considered that the density gets so high because we start with a picture that a black hole was just a big glass, a gas cloud, which started to feel a little bit isolated from its neighbors, and it felt like it was easier to gravitationally collapse than to not, just following the gravitational um, uh, attraction from the object here with the entire mass of the black hole. And so once it starts to collapse a little bit, then its density um, contrast above the background of all matter around it becomes higher, and it becomes more self-attractive, and so it contracts faster, and faster, and faster, and faster, and faster, and then boom. Suddenly, it's at an infinitely high density and no diameter. It's considered to have completely collapsed when a photon of light can't escape from it. And so then it becomes a physical object hurtling through space? That's what it becomes. Hmm. And space might be at the center of a galaxy. It usually is. So before it collapses, it is something that is, does it, eat, does it take up space? Is it physical? It is a physical ball of principally hydrogen hmm. because this was some of the first structure to move to um, form in the universe in the first day. And um, so today we see it farther down in its history and we see the collapse having gone to whatever it's going to go to. Remember, this started 14 billion years ago and on a time scale of about half a billion years, the uh, it's considered that the collapse would have occurred. So if only the, the first 30th of the age of the universe, um, that's when the uh, black hole object uh, came. Now, I use again the word black hole object because that view of a gravitationally collapsing gas cloud has an important omission. Which is? I avoid saying it's wrong. <laughs> let's, well, let's avoid saying it. Big so we won't, we won't say that it's wrong. So without saying that it's wrong. <laughs> at, at a certain point, the gravitational field says, no, space cannot um, embody or hold or contain an object of such great density. And this the quantum aspect of the universe that we haven't known how to incorporate in the black hole model. It will take me, it would take me 15 minutes, and maybe we'll do it sometime for you to make for me to explain um, exactly how this MECO alternative to a black hole works. But basically, um, the long and short of it is that, yes, indeed, the gas cloud collapses and starts collapsing. But at some point before you get to infinite density, at some finite critical density, something happens. 
And that is the quantum field says, no, wait a minute, I'm not having any part of this. We have our rules here, and you can't have two particles occupying the same volume of space. And so we're going to get stressed out here. And what they do in response is making electron-positron pairs. It's easier for the collapsing object to flood itself with these electron-positron pairs, which before I called positronium, and in such number, as many as it takes, that it halts to collapse. What it does is basically raise something like the temperature. It raises the temperature so that the, the collapse stops. That's the result of the magnetic field getting so compressed, and um, the space cannot accommodate uh, a further collapse, just the way it is. Anyway, um, that makes this alternative that's black hole-like, but everybody knows that the black hole object cannot have a magnetic field that comes out because the magnetic field couldn't penetrate the infinite density that it would be at. The, 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 the magnetic lines just can't get out. And so that object is not what nature makes. And instead, we're now seeing from this picture that was made by the Event Horizon Telescope, we're seeing the nature of the polarized light, and we trace the origin of that polarized light to the filaments that we photograph with the Boeing 747 equipped with the tail with the uh, telescope in the back, in the back room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the back room. <laughs> uh, and the the scientists are there with their recorders and and uh, optical devices and so on and monitoring all this in a pressurized compartment on the other side of the door of the aircraft. So um, the flight is well attended by technicians and scientists, and the data are taken and uh, partially analyzed in flight, but then taken to a laboratory for further analysis in the usual way. We get the images from the airplane at near-infrared wavelengths. And those um, uh, are in the region of 30 microns, or 30,000 angstroms. You know that the light we see is about 5,000 angstroms. Well, there are longer wavelengths of the same kind of radiation. And the ones at around 30,000 angstroms are of particular use to us because they propagate through the universe more cleanly than the 5,000 angstrom ones. And what does that mean, more cleanly? Well, you see there's dust in space. Sure. And the dust will mix, uh, mix up the light uh, at the shorter visible wavelengths, but that doesn't work well at all at the longer wavelengths. That's just the way it is it's more likely that you'll find a clear path from the source to your eye, the source at the center of the galaxy. Hmm. That's a long way off. Um, Remember that that's at um, about uh, 32 light years away, uh, 32,000 light years away, uh, the distance of the galactic center. Yeah, you you said remember that. We're very sensitive to this uh, transparency of the the atmosphere, to the light, which improves by going to the longer wavelengths. You told me in one of our first chats, uh, before we ever started recording something, uh, and I think I I got it done right, because I don't believe we've had it on one of our recorded chats. You said, please correct me if I'm wrong, because now I, I wrote this down many months ago, and uh, so I'm trust I'm trusting uh, I'm trusting my own note taking from back then. You said our universe is an inside out black hole. That's correct. Okay, and I stand by it. Bring me uh, through that. 
I'm starting to uh, talk with other people about it, and it's starting to make more and more sense. Please now, bring us to that. Okay. Uh, your question exactly was what brought me to it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that too. I, I would hope to understand that explanation because <laughs> I'm nervous okay. about trying to understand the one that I asked for. <laughs> okay. So um, take it away. Um, we have presently the idea of the universe having a Big Bang beginning. And once that idea came out there, then suddenly it was very quickly adopted, and basically nobody questioned it anymore, except a few radicals. What we see is that objects, the farther away they are, the higher redshift we see their light occurring at. And so that's the famous Hubble redshift law. And it's nice because if we look at a different distant galaxy, then we can measure the wavelengths at which the hydrogen lines are recognized as a pattern in the spectrum among the many spectral lines. And when that's done, we can measure the redshift. And for the measure of the redshift and this Hubble expansion law, we can compute the distance of the distant galaxy. So that's convenient, and that way we can make all maps of the three-dimensional universe surrounding us by just measuring patiently, um, galaxy by galaxy, the pattern of spectral lines, and measuring therefore, thereby the redshift of that galaxy, and knowing from the Hubble relation, the Hubble law, how far this object is away. And so from that, we can show in 3D the patterning of all the galaxies and, and stars, if there are any, but we don't see stars at such large distances. So we can just make a map in three dimensions of all the galaxies. What we're seeing now is to, that the, this, the um, description of let me now change to the word collapsed objects, because we've got now black hole or Miko, and um, I'm a little reluctant to to stick you with this Miko word, but I have to talk about it because okay. it's what the universe is made out of. Okay. Go black on. holes, by that traditional dis definition, do not exist. Basically, all of the astronomical literature says black hole and is uh, written as though the object in the universe is this completely collapsed object. But in fact, the, the object collapsed stopped before it got to total infinite density. And in fact, what you have instead is a different kind of object called the Miko, and I explained how a pressure occurs during the collapse process that collapse that stops the collapse and the the, uh, the astronomical literature talks about this being an eddington limited surface and that means that Edding, sir arthur eddington was the first person to realize that um there had to be some limit to how far the collapse could proceed before the universe had the ability to describe as a quantum field uh, an object that was even denser. It's purely a quantum problem that we have to have a Miko object, the magnetic eternally collapsing object, and not the totally collapsed black hole object. And the first inkling we had that the black hole did not exist was because everybody knew that a black hole in the classical old definition could not have a magnetic field. A theorem called black holes have no hair was taught to graduate students on the first day. I'll say that again. Black holes now have no hair is taught 
to graduate students on the first day, but that only refers to the object that Sir Arthur Eddington realized would not occur because the collapse would stop. What does it mean um, by having no hair? Uh, no magnetic fields. Okay. No hair meant uh, this thing doesn't have any magnetic fields. I understand. It can't because they couldn't get out uh, at the speed of light, and particles can't get out for, get out past the speed of light. And um, so there would be a hard border there, and so uh, there can't be any magnetic field outside. Well, guess what? Um, when a radio telescope in Bonn, Germany, observed the black hole at the center of our galaxy, they made a critical object of a star seen just past the side of the central object, the uh, Miko, um, and they noticed that it had the signature of a strong magnetic field in its radio properties, which I won't try to explain. Just let's stop at, there is a black hole. The classic def defined black hole with infinite density does not exist. Therefore, we have to talk about what the Miko does. Okay, so this is going to be rough. <laughs> It's going to be rough. It's, this is this is so good. Uh, so, what does the how does the black hole exist then in uh, in the non classical sense? So, what what is a black hole now? Um, there is no such thing made by nature. Okay, okay. So, nature makes this other this other object, and that's been observed first, as I said, with radio astronomy. Mm -hmm. And now we see from the um, infrared image made by the airplane with the telescope in the back, um, the SOFIA project, and the forecast was the name of the camera. And that picture was made at three infrared wavelengths. And that's those pictures that I sent you. So that image showed the structures uh, that. Um, trap electrons outside of the surface of what's not a black hole, but a Miko object. And so um, I have a picture that I sent you mm -hmm. that was made with the SOFIA forecast telescope. And so I showed a mock-up of that because it's really a three-dimensional object. Yeah. So voila. Here is the object that's actually made by nature. Right. So that's what this I saw. Object if you put that up. Yeah. is the picture that you saw, but it was slightly tilted. Mm -hmm. And we'll Something put that up. Like this. It was kind of oval, wasn't it? It looks like a steering wheel with three spokes in it. Well, kind of, yeah. yeah. Hey, that's yeah. very good. I didn't think of that. And I'm an antique car guy. Yeah, uh, you are. Shame on you. You should know that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, um, if I sh showed it to you face on, then you would see this. Sure. And I'm doing this because this shows two parts of the outer structure of the Miko object. What this is, is the ring of infalling matter that gets stuck at this place, which <laughs> um, is understood, but not in 20 words or less. So Water, matter is being attracted from the outside gas and dust and space all over the universe falling toward this massive object. And on its way in, and it uh, reaches the, or the uh, vicinity of the black hole, but not much of it is on a direct course. So if it's, go if it's off center, if it was going to bypass slightly to the right or to the left and come this way, it in fact gets tracked and trapped by the magnetic fields that emanate from the center of this object. Wait, so, oh, sorry, quick, uh, quick offshoot of a question. What, where does the dust originate that exists in space? It probably comes from wasted planets or collided planets. Hmm. What happens is that 
matter aggregates in the universe on many scales, on what are called the cosmic voids, on the scale of clusters of galaxies, the scale of galaxies, the scale of galaxy clusters, and on the scale of planets like the Earth. The Earth was actually made at the beginning of time. We attach an age four and a half million years to it. That may be the most recent times it got remanufactured, perhaps by colliding with another planet or by other things that have happened. But anyway, um, the Earth, um, if it now collides with another planet, there will be dust all over. And we can sample this dust. NASA has sent up an explorer called the Sampler mission, S-A-M-P-L-E-R. That was a spacecraft in Earth orbit, wide Earth orbit, that at one point after it was launched and checked out, it opened a little gel cap to the sky. And so now the spacecraft was flying through space, and um, the gel was collecting the little tiny particles of dust in the interstellar medium that had always been inferred to be there. After a short sampling time, the device was closed again, and the sampler dropped back to Earth, eventually parachuting down, recovered hmm. the usual way, and taken to a laboratory for analysis. And now we have an analysis of what is the interstellar dust. And it consists of approximately three main subcomponents. The three main subcomponents are, there is one, a tar-like substance, which is actually petroleum. The second one is sandy grains, like beach sand, but some of them are aggregated beach sand, small rocks. Or they might be medium rocks, or a few large rocks. And then, additional, the third one is scraps of old biological specimens, of which the most common one is the diatome. They have a kind of a skeletal structure that we recognize. Diatomes are the same thing as algae in the ocean. It's whale food. But that gets all over space and is now polluting other planets. And the stuff that we emitted long ago um, is now um, a journey bound through space. Anything it gets close to, it pollutes with Earth chemistry. Likewise, we are polluted by chemistry from distant planets around distant stars. And those diatoms also originate from uh, planets outside of Earth? Uh, almost certainly, but that's why we see them hmm. when we collect the random stuff um, uh, uh, floating in the sky that the Earth and its, in its motion is now intersecting and it's now being brought back to Earth with the sampler mission. So th this is actually, something... yeah. Actually, even more interesting... Is the, is the portion that I called tar yes. or petroleum. Yep. Now, I wish I had made a model of this, but um, you know what buckyballs are. These are dodecahedrons, the, the geometrical object that has all pentagon faces, 20 pentagon faces. So at every interface between the surfaces, the facets of the uh, dodecahedron, there's a little star, uh, there's a little uh, carbon uh, molecule. Mm -hmm. and, um, this is able to make structure very quickly, which is how plants grow so fast. The creation of these uh, polyhedrons um, causes plants to grow fast, and when the plants die, they slowly deteriorate and create petroleum. So remember, this is a scheme where plants on a planet, life, organic matter that has 
um, uh, the spiral form. Uh, why can't I think of the word? Uh, uh, DNA? A DNA. RNA, yeah. And so we're spilling DNA, and other planets that have collided have spilled out their DNA. These planets obviously had oceans because we can see that the diatoms had a living place. And also, uh, when they collided and the cores really butted heads, then they splintered out and, and self-destructed and sent rocks and all the way down to dust all through the universe. And that's also the sand component that I said that the sampler NASA mission uh, obtained for us. So you have three principal components in the interstellar dust reveal the existence of life. So um, what we're saying is there is evidence today, scientific evidence collected by NASA, available online free as data sets, um, that is directly shouting at us that there's life all over the universe. So I, I'm not going to begrudge my schooling because uh, I, I left high school, uh, or I graduated from high school in the early 90s. But I mean, I can tell you that we didn't learn any of this then. Uh, Absolutely. And, it wasn't known then. Okay. Um, but I, I now I'm going to interview my kids. <laughs> uh-huh. I, I'm not sure they know this. Well, they might be able to teach you what you need to know. Oh, I like it. I like it. If petroleum and dust are the indicators that, uh, or, or uh, excuse me, petroleum and diatoms um, are is what evidenced as the smallest physical particle that we can see or collect, then those particles are. We can assume those particles are also the building blocks of life. Uh, they almost certainly have the capacity to spread life throughout the universe. Okay. Don't forget you also have another minor problem of if this stuff impinges on the atmosphere, well, you've seen that. We call that meteorites. Right, right. Unfortunately, that simply decomposes them and evaporates them in many cases. So probably most of it gets lost and observed and absorbed in the atmosphere. On the other hand, the larger grains will survive. And what I've told you was seen in the sampler mission has also been found when you examine meteors. Some of them that uh, have fallen um, have been sliced open in geological laboratories. And at the centers of some of these rocks um, are some native natural materials that somehow uh, the rocks got made out of sometime in the distant past of the universe. And so when we analyze those uh, interesting interiors of rocks, we find approximately the same result. A third of what we see is ordinary sand grains or sand dust or finely ground stones as in colliding rocks. And then also you see signs of diatoms and typically three or four other species that we can recognize often in variants that aren't quite mistaken for terrestrial versions. that are a little bit different, maybe in color or maybe in structuring in some way. They're like ones we recognize, but not exactly in many cases. And then you have the petroleum. So that's seen in the dust sampler mission, Mm -hmm. and it's also seen by cutting rock samples open. This was being done largely in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. But there can be no doubt today by any uh, informed scientist that life exists all over the universe. We see it in the interstellar medium, the space between the stars. 
uh, is it a stretch to assume that life life has um uh, in millions tens of millions, hundred millions billions of years uh formed and destroyed and reformed and redestroyed over and over again and we're just a yeah. blip, a blip on that cycle and yeah everything's getting recycled good for you well we we could have existed millions of years ago um uh, yeah, I think I'm better than the last one. <laughs> I, we're we're going to be talking to Michael uh, uh, Michael Cremo, uh, who is um, a researcher, an archaeologist, uh, archaeolog archaeological mm -hmm. researcher, and he wrote something. I, I picked it up. I haven't read it just yet, but I've listened to uh, many of his talks enough to get interested in having him come on the on the podcast about um, how. We have ex human beings have possibly existed here longer than what our uh, uh, modern archaeology tells us, and that's because the science was already there, but ignored or cast away for a more popular narrative. So I agree about that. Um, I'm leaving that to other people that sure. are better informed than I myself. But um, uh, long fostered suspicions that there could have been other, other forms of life on earth that we just can't know about because uh, they've left they vanished without a trace because you know we talk about the earth having had a lifetime of at least four and a half billion years mm. and i think it's actually even longer than that and that's time for a lot of geological changes <laughs> sure sure Look at what we're doing to the earth in just, what, 200 yeah, years? Yeah, just our lifetimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just want to circle back on one last thing because you've indicated to me uh, maybe 20 minutes ago um, about black holes in the classical sense not existing um, based on, obviously, your explanations just, just now and during this session. But you also, uh, you've indicated to me, to us, to the listener, uh, in the last couple of episodes uh, together, that you see and believe that thoughts and our memories reside in the black hole. So I, I, I just want to. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, so I, I want to bring I want to bring that to a point. Like I, to a, when I mean a point, I mean like an arrowhead. Like what what is what does this mean? If there's no if no if there if um, if the the theories of the classical black hole do not exist. What is the black hole that you speak of when you say that our thoughts and memories reside there? Yes. Um, now, understand that the quantum attribute of space, that is quantum space, um, is recording right now um, everything that you and I are saying. These thoughts get stored in a holographic sense. In other words, our conversation and our being as individuals uh, is registered by waveforms that are like waveforms that our head interprets and that um, are part of our consciousness and that record um, this, this meeting, this gathering, not as a, a physical object, that you will plug into a computer somewhere, but rather the overall wave. They're just little ripples of modifications of the of the whole wave that describes the entire Earth, everything on and in the Earth, and that is recorded instantaneously for the moment that's occurring, and then this waveform hologram um, quantum space is constantly shifting slightly a little bit because uh, different people are getting together and new conversations and there's evolution in the human condition and all of that. And so all of these slightly modified things are also being uh, carried by space. And then um, uh, when that goes to the vicinity of the black hole, it kind of wraps itself around for this time of the universe, and again, outside of that, for a slightly later time, 
and outside of that, a slightly later time. And so you have an onion layering of uh, the information that's describing our conversation and everything else in our civilization and in our physical structure, all being stored. Now, in the black hole, as you get closer to the center of the object, everything appears redshifted because of this redshifting by the gravitational field. That might engender some questions, and um, I can explain it more deeply, but let me see, let me first tell you where we're going with this. Hmm. That means that the Miko object has on its surface and, and in a relationship or in a contact with the modern thing, uh, which is stored in outer layers of the same black hole. That is, all history near the inside, my recent history on the outside. And so the black hole is acting like nature's hard drive. It has with it the record of the time uh, and place of all things on the surface of the Earth, which created this uh, gravitational field that creates the, uh, the structuring. And so um, everything about our lives is stored in all the black holes of the universe because they're all carried by this quantum hologram. And so just as I told you a little while ago, if you have on the Earth all of these radio telescopes on the South Pole, in Arizona, and in Hawaii, and in uh, Europe, and in uh, the Orient, Korea, Japan, I suppose. Um, so those together allow you to make a complete picture of, um, uh, of what the black hole is. And in a similar way, the human mind can read the hologram and get glimpses of the past. So that's how black holes become the carriers of all information, and therefore they're the black hole uh, hard drives, or the hard drives that store everything. So, and, but so that includes thoughts and memories and feelings. Yes. Okay. And the, the less impact they have on us, the lower the amplitude of this wave. In other words, the wave that's describing a mosquito, you know, is oscillations about this big and, you know, a very low amplitude of, of being, sure. whereas your wave is humongous. Nice. You're a big guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's so right, so. you have a big impact on the universe around you, and so that wave is a high amplitude wave. But all of our waves contribute to the, the total totality of all waves. Waves, and that's the quantum hologram. And so um, that gets stored, stored, stored onion layer upon onion layer upon onion layer, describing more recent times. Now, the mm -hmm. past events gradually get, get um, reduced or sort of, um, what would you say, um, they get Compressed? Uh, more in amplitude because the more recent ones are bigger waves. The other ones just kind of mm. fade out in the background, but they're never lost entirely. What about so, future waves? Uh, the, the, no, that's a much more interesting question that brings in the horizon of the universe, mm. or the uh, distant horizon, we call it. And it's being the, the character of an inside-out black hole. Remember that the Miko object describes the physical space around it uh, at all times, and um, that um, uh, gradually gets buried in layers nearer the center of the object, and then all of the more modern history gets stored on the outside. In the same way, the distant horizon um is different from a 
black hole inside the universe because it has a pure quantum state in its interior and is recording physical space on the exterior of the black hole. Now, the distant horizon of the universe is backwards of that. The outside of the horizon of our universe is a description of the possibility of all universes, and the inside surface of that distant horizon is the physical description of our interior of the universe, all stored as quantum information. And so it's just like the reverse of a Miko or a black hole. The black hole is physical outside, pure quantum inside. The distant horizon is pure physical inside and pure quantum outside. It turns out that our universe then is but a bubble in the sea of all possible universes. It's a physical of it's a it's a bubble of physical being in a sea of potential for such bubbles and also for the potential of there being a divine spirit which is now in contact with these surface bubbles with all the universes. If there is a supreme being, you can go to the G word if you like, capital G O D mm-hmm. if you like. But there apparently is such a thing, which is um, the existence of a super quantum field that is super to all of the little fields that describe individual universes. So we are but bubbles of physicality in the possibility of a supreme being. Why don't we end it right there? Because I... It's too much to take up. I, uh, you, I actually, uh, I'm, I'm about to explode. <laughs> I, uh, but I want I want to continue this conversation. Sure, so, it's cool as hell. Let's, yeah. I, oh, yeah, absolutely. There's nothing I agree with more. Uh, yeah. So let let's uh, let's take that on at the beginning of the next conversation. Okay.